Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for attending this talk. Um, just to let you know the background to this talk and how I, how I put this together is that there was a case on vegetarianism in the UK in 2019. And it was a tribunal case, so it was work related. And the judge found that uh, vegetarianism wasn't a protected belief. Now, you might say, well, why am I hearing about vegetarianism? I'll explain that in a second. Um, the courts tend to treat veganism and vegetarianism under the same category with regards to protection. And traditionally, they've both been protected belief systems. So when you've got a judgment like that, it's very worrying because it means the next time you could have some judge turning around and saying, well, veganism isn't a protected belief. So what happened was I decided I'd do some writing and get some articles published on the vegetarian case. And so at work, we have a database called Westlaw. So if you want to find all the previous writings on any area of the law, Westlaw is probably the best database available. So anyway, I did a search for a number of terms like vegetarianism, veganism, etc. And I was very surprised to see that there was a lot of material came up. So I published some works just specifically on the case about vegetarianism not being recognized. And then I had uh, a lot of material left over. So this presentation is the leftover material, but it's really, really interesting for our purposes because what it shows is that, first of all, the courts have long recognized vegetarianism and veganism as protected rights. And then, um, second of all, that it like vegetarianism and veganism arise in a lot of different contexts. So um, there are child custody cases, there are trademark cases, um, there's even a murder case. But anyway, <laughs> I'll, I'll get to that mystery in a few minutes. So then just to reiterate, when we talk about the meaning of the terms vegetarian and vegan, I wanted to make a few points. They're normally treated the same um, by the courts because under human rights legislation, they're seen as secular beliefs and they fall under freedom of conscience belief. And actually, I think there's a case for it to be extended to religion because what you're going to see is a lot of the cases in which these are pleaded, um, they're attached to religious practices, but the courts don't mention religion at all. And they just sort of see it as, oh, well, you know, it's under this article, Article 9 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, but they sort of don't give very much importance to the fact that an awful lot of the pleadings are on religious grounds. And that's just kind of a side because we're going to see in one of the cases, it was a bit strange because the court sort of said, well, you know, if you went to a vegan restaurant and you tried to enforce this, that would be fine. But if you're doing it for just religious reasons, it wouldn't. So you can, when you're making um, a plea, you can plea, like you can make your appeal to the court or your plea to the court under several different categories. So it would be a strategic move if you are vegetarian or vegan um, for a religious reason or for a secular reason or that you're somewhere in between to try and make a plea under several categories because they might find for you under one and not for you under the other. So that's just a, a point of, of interest, I think. Um, and then the second reason that I use the term vegetarian is that there are court cases from the 19th century in which vegetarianism was recognized and the term vegan hadn't been coined yet. So going back in history, vegetarianism was an umbrella term of practices that at one end, they just didn't eat meat. And at the other end, then there was all the care for the animals so that you wouldn't use their products, you wouldn't use dairy, honey or eggs. And the other thing about it is that actually a lot of the vegetarian, um, shall we say practitioners like vegetarians, were vegan. So there was a tension even going back to the 19th century about that. And the UK Vegetarian Society was founded in 1847. 
It defines vegetarian as someone who doesn't eat meat, fish, chicken, or animal byproducts of slaughter. Can you all hear me all right? Yes. Okay, good, thanks. And then vegetarianism can be interpreted as an umbrella term because we've got linguistic refinements such as ovo-vegetarian, lacto-ovo-vegetarian, lacto-vegetarian. So you can dump all of that and actually be a de facto vegan, but you might also describe yourself as a strict vegetarian. Now, anyway, the, the point about it is that the courts mightn't get into the nitty gritty of the difference. And it's probably in our interests actually that they don't because the minute the court starts to examine your beliefs, then it might not agree with you, do you know? And it's better actually that they take an objective approach so they just accept your belief as it is and providing you're not doing any harm, then you'll get protection under the legislation. So, oh yeah, there was one other thing I wanted to mention too about the Vegetarian Society is that it was founded on religious, like there was a very strong religious background to it. So um, it was the founder of the Bible Christian Church who was very involved in vegetarianism and it was almost seen as a penance. And the two celebrity chefs, the Hairy Bikers, did a lovely program on vegetarianism a few years ago. It's up on YouTube. And they actually visit the Vegetarian Society. Um, and, you know, they, they do the whole program about that. And they make a very interesting point that vegetarianism, when it started out, like under the, under the umbrella, I suppose, of the society, it was seen as something quite Spartan and something quite um, penance based. And now it's really come full circle and it's very, very opulent. So when you think of, you know, the Buddha bowls that you can get, they're multicolored with foods from all over the world, that sort of thing. So the slide that I'm on now, vegan and uh, vegetarian and vegan rights. So there are two cases heard by the same judge and they're tribunal cases, which means that they were work related. So their special tribunals have been set up to hear work related cases. So like even at work, if you think about it, if you've got a dispute with your boss and you go to the union and the dispute doesn't get resolved, you'll go to a tribunal and not to a general court. It's just a different system. Um, so then they're kind of different judgments as well. Anyway, the Connorsby case was the case that kind of really made me feel, well, I have to write something about this and have to get involved in, I suppose, being a source of knowledge. Um, so Connorsby was, uh, he was a, an employee at a hotel and he was vegetarian and he was getting a lot of teasing at work. And eventually his workmates told him that they had spiked his food. And he took the employer to a tribunal and very shockingly, he lost. And what the judge said was that vegetarianism wasn't a coherent belief because people were vegetarian for various reasons. And he talked at length about veganism and that people were all vegan for one reason and one reason only. And I thought, oh my goodness, when you read the judgment, it's very evangelical. And I felt that the judge had been very influenced by particular uh, by a particular worldview, so a very exclusive one. And then the next year, the same judge heard another case, the Casa Mithana case, in which a vegan took his employer to work because they had been, even though they're the League Against Cruel Sports, they had been investing in, um, in, in, in um, sources that were damaging to animals. So he got into a dispute, he went to public, he was sacked, he took a tribunal case, he won, and they settled. So what was significant about this judgment was that vegan rights were specifically recognized by a court. Um, and the unfortunate thing is it was the same judge as, as was in the Conisby case, and his description of veganism was quite different. So he was much more um, sympathetic to vegans who might not all be vegan for the same reason or who might be on a journey. So, but anyway, so as matters currently stand, 
vegetarianism at tribunal level is not recognized. So you can be vegetarian and have your food spiked at work. And if that decision is followed, and very unfortunately, it has been quoted, um, then you'll get no protection. Whereas if you're vegan, you do get protection. So that's where it stands at the moment. Um, now, so then there are a few cases that I just came along, uh, came across in my studies, and I've just kind of put them under various categories. So there are actually a number of Irish cases, which is very interesting. The first one in Cranston, um, Webb and Oldfield, as you can see, it's from 1898. So before independence, and it was about a woman who lived in Belfast and she left a legacy in her will to the Manchester and London Vegetarian Societies. And what had happened was there's a rule in property law that you can't leave your property in a particular way that would tie it down in perpetuity, right? So it's a very complicated rule, so I'm not going to get into it. But basically, if if, if you offend the rule against perpetuities, then your, your legacy won't be upheld by the court. So what would happen is it would go back into your estate and it wouldn't go where you wanted it to go. So it might go back to the relatives who are contesting the will, right? So the only thing that would save the legacy was that if it was for a charitable purpose. And so the question for the court was, is leaving money to um, a vegetarian society for a charitable purpose? So the Court of Chancery said yes, and it was appealed. So it went to the Irish Court of Appeal and they upheld it. So that was quite amazing. And I couldn't believe the judgment because they just totally accepted that vegetarianism was a thing. You know, they had no problem with it at all. And that's going back, as I say, 1898. Then there are two cases in Ireland in which that judgment was quoted and vegetarianism again was approved. And in the um, read the Wirt Library, that case, um, it was actually the former Chief Justice, Mr. Justice Keane, who used vegetarianism as an example of a belief that a lot of people didn't follow, but that didn't matter, that it would be upheld anyway. So, and I've just put some references there. Um, oh yeah, there was a warning to the RSPCA then um, not, to, uh, not to be um, to, what can I say? Um, not, not to promote vegetarianism. It's a lot of their board were vegetarians and that was seen as being something that could be detrimental to their aims, which when you think of it is rather odd. But you have got there that uh, that case in which the League Against Cruel Sports were actually investing in um, in funds that were detrimental to animals. So problematic. <laughs> so then this is just a, a case that um, basically there was a uh, something had to be sorted out about the entrance and the exit from a building, and there was a vegetarian cafe cited there and the court didn't have any problem with it and the reason that i included that is as i say again vegetarianism was mentioned and it's just it's just really interesting to see that the courts had absolutely no problem with it um, so then there are a few cases that came up on capacity so that's that refers to your capacity to make a decision uh, this is a case the first one from 1909 and it was just that there was um, somebody who was um, convicted of forgery. So he appealed his sentence of seven years. And there was just a description of him as being abnormal, a vegetarian, a dapple, dab dabbler in the occult scientists and a champion of so-called lost causes such as astrology and theosophy. He wasn't a lunatic, but he was just peculiar. So <laughs> that was um, quite a long list. And the other thing, too, is that just to mention that a lot of the freedom fighters around 1916 in Ireland um, were followers of theosophy and vegetarianism. And there was a lot of kind of belief in the occult. I mean, Yeats, the, the poet W.B. Yeats was, I think, um, a keen occultist. So 
1909 that's close enough to um, the rising and uh, as, as you can see, um, so we, I suppose we had a cohort of people in this country who um, were pursuing practices that maybe weren't approved of in certain courts. But again, you know, this is kind of, um, it's, it, it's not a terribly important case, but um, I just thought it was interesting to see the portrayal because that has really changed. Um, the, another case under the um, heading of capacity. So this is, these cases basically arise where somebody has left money to the vegan society or the vegetarian society depriving their relatives. So the relatives challenge the will. And of course, what they're trying to make out is that maybe the, the person who left the legacy in the will didn't have the capacity to do so because they had some sort of mental impairment. And you can see that um, in this case, such a challenge was made, but the court upheld the legacy to the vegan society. Um, the person who left it, uh, Jewel, um, had uh, had had a, a, a head injury, but that didn't mean that leaving money to the vegan society was an irrational act. Okay, um, so that's quite a. I mean, it's it's odd that it comes up, but it's affirming that the courts don't have any problem with veganism. And um, I think that what I've really um, enjoyed about this journey for myself is that it really gives me an awful lot of confidence when we come across restaurants who are rude to us because they're breaking the law. And that's very, very clear from the court cases and their attitude. And even before the um, before the European Convention on Human Rights came into force, which is kind of quite recent in Britain and Ireland, um, we can see that the courts were accepting that vegetarianism and veganism were uh, practices that were well known and not abnormal. So there's another case here in which um, a will was made by a man who was suffering from schizophrenia and you see he left nearly the majority of his state over a million to the vegetarian society rather than his family of course that was challenged but the legacy was upheld because the court said that he didn't lack testamentary capacity and what that means basically is that the fact that you're schizophrenic schizophrenic doesn't mean that you're not rational enough to know where you're leaving your money and the thing about capacity, um, I have a brother with a, a mental, a long term mental illness is you can have capacity on some things and not on others. So the law is kind of quite difficult in that respect, and you wouldn't always have guidance from the legislation. So what I'm saying here is that in this case, the judge really was on their own. So they still um, decided in favor of these legacies. Um, and then, oh, there's just a comment from Kevin O'Higgins uh, in a court case going back years ago. It's just a more there. He's, um, he's the editor of the, the Irish Jurist, which is a law journal in Ireland. And um, Kevin O'Higgins, or um, one of the, the, the politicians early in the foundation of the state, he compared vegetarians in a very negative way with a small cohort of women. And uh, his policies weren't very popular. And he said that, you know, they're trying to have a wider influence than their numbers allowed. So that was just a comment in Ireland. But as I mentioned, we've got a court of appeal case and then we've got a very, very eminent judge who had no problems with vegetarianism at all. So then um, I just kind of, uh, I'm not going to go into this in great detail because I have another talk in which I go into the rights aspect more, but just it's interesting to know the sources of law. So the rights in international and European law. So the UN obviously was founded in the 1940s. And so they had a universal declaration and of human rights. And out of that came the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights so they're enforceable and all of these documents, European Convention on Human Rights, the charter under the EU and generally constitutions as well, they all protect religious freedom. 
and freedom of thought and conscience. And it's quite widely accepted now that vegetarianism and veganism are covered by that. So um, then I just put a, a slide there. I'll, I'll let you have the slides afterwards. Well, they'd probably be up on your site anyway. So that's absolutely fine. You can read through it and, uh, and you know, just email me with any questions you've got. Now, I just wanted to explain something a little bit strange here. So the European Convention on Human Rights um, is dated from 1950. Now, there are two different types of legal systems in the world when it comes to international law, what's known as a monist state and a dualist state. So a monist state is where when an international um, convention is passed, it's automatically binding. Spain and Argentina are examples of monist states. And then there are dualist states such as Britain and Ireland. And when an international convention is passed, we then have to pass it into our law. And that can take ages. So the convention wasn't passed into British law until 1998. And that became effective two years later because there's a bureaucratic process that it has to go through. And then in Irish law, it was passed into our law in 2003. But an interesting thing that we did is we put it beneath the constitution. And I think one of the reasons for that is abortion wasn't legal at the time. And abortion rights are generally liberalized under the rights of privacy. So the privacy right in European law is much greater than the privacy right in Irish law. So if you brought in the European Convention on Human Rights without putting it subject to the constitution, then the privacy right would have been much stronger. So I think that was a little bit of a deft um, action on the part of the Irish legislator to avoid any difficult questions that might come up within their elected term. Now, the other thing is that something then arises that's very odd. So it means that in Ireland, um, we've got a huge number of sources of rights. And if you fail at one set of rights, then you can actually appeal under another set of rights under the European Convention. So I'll just explain. So we've domesticated the convention uh, under the European, or sorry, the, yeah, you, the European Convention on Human Rights Act. So you've got a set of rights there. So just supposing you made a claim under that convention and you failed, you could actually then appeal to the European Court of Human Rights under the European Convention on Human Rights. So it's actually what it's done is it's introduced a dual regime. So it's just odd, um, but it's what makes law very interesting. <laughs> so now, of course, the UK then it's withdrawn from the EU. It isn't bound by the convention. Um, they still have the Human Rights Act, but I mean, they've been rattling the cage for years there that they're going to pull out of the convention and the court. And what they always do is they always use kind of um, very emotive terrorist cases. So, for example, there was a case a few years ago in which they wanted to extradite a terrorist to Jordan. And um, so the Home Secretary was saying, like, we're going to get him out. But there was no guarantee that he wouldn't be tortured when he'd go back to Jordan. So he won at the European he, he won his case in the European Court of Human Rights. So how they compromised in order to extradite him was they got a guarantee from the Jordanian government that he wouldn't be tortured. Now, that's not an unusual practice. That also happens in the US if they arrest a Mexican citizen for a felony that carries the death penalty, um, what they'll do, and it's, it's to maintain kind of good relations between states as well, is they'll say, well, okay, um, you know, we're gonna prosecute him and et cetera but we won't apply the death penalty in this case. So for example, if a Mexican citizen had committed a murder in the US and then gone back to Mexico and the US wanted to extradite that person, 
that's the sort of the compromise that they uh, that they come up with, right? So this um, the withdrawal is it's a, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a tricky area because on the one hand, um, if they pull out of the European Convention on Human Rights, you can still fall back on the other rights. So the, the courts have recognised um, rights, etc. But you have this troublesome case from the tribunal, as I said, in which vegetarianism hasn't been recognised. And unfortunately, they haven't got around to appealing it yet. So then um, their religion and conscience often arise during incarceration. And the principle of giving you appropriate food when you're in prison is that if you commit a crime and you're deprived of your liberty, the deprivation of liberty by being in prison is your punishment. They're not allowed then to add on more punishments, do you know? So your religious freedom should be respected. And I must say, Britain has been quite good about this. So like this is a case that I came across from 1988 and the prison already provided a vegetarian diet for the prisoners. So the dispute was actually about something else that Boyle wanted to, um, he wanted to get supplements and he didn't want his correspondence to be opened. So it was more about that than anything else. But I thought the case was interesting because it shows that, you know, um, that respect for dietary preferences um, are kind of pretty well established. There's another case then again, it's somebody who was imprisoned in uh, Greece. And in that case, it wasn't respected. And again, he didn't make an appeal on the basis of diet, but it was just tangential to what the case was about. Um, there's a case, uh, H and the United Kingdom from 1992, and that was appealed to the European Court of Human Rights. And in that case, that veganism was recognized as a protected belief under European um, law. Now, the guy didn't win his case because he was a bit of a sod, to be honest. <laughs> and what had happened is that um, he objected to working in a print work because he said that the dyes used there uh, contained animal products. So it was against his beliefs. And so the court recognized that veganism would be honored, but he had to fulfill some bureaucratic require requirements such as filling in forms, which he failed to do. So don't jump the gun if you come across a case in which like um, beliefs haven't been recognized. There might actually be a bit more to the story. So um, then there are just a few interesting cases, again, relating to religion and food. And um, so uh, Orthodox Jews, um, they obviously in, in, in prison, if they're incarcerated, they want kosher food. But uh, there was a particular case in which the, um, the complainant was, he, he, wanted, he wanted kosher food, but he wanted meat. So what the prison had done was to offer him vegetarian kosher food. And he had declined that. And generally, those sorts of cases will be unsuccessful because what the prison has done is a very sensible approach. Um, they've taken a cuisine that will appeal to pretty much everybody who's got, um, you know, a, a food restriction. Nowadays, if you had a vegan diet and a meat diet, well, the vegan diet is going to cover kosher, halal and vegetarian as well. So rather than kind of making six different meals, um, they just did one. So you won't win um, if you're kind of pushing for a specific food, but then maybe having a particular type of meat on top of it necessarily. What the courts are allowed to do, or sorry, what the institutions are allowed to do is there's a kind of a balance. So they balance the convenience with um, other considerations. So what's of interest is that the prison service in ireland revamped its menu in 2016 and they ensured the provision of a vegan and vegetarian food for prisoners so it doesn't seem to be much of a problem here um, 
There are two cases then from the European Court of Human Rights, again in relation to people being in prison, and um, again in relation to people uh, claiming vegetarian diets as they were Buddhist. So the Jacobs B, uh, case, he won 3,000 euros compensation because the prison wouldn't provide him for wouldn't provide adequate food for him, and Bartik and Romania, pretty much the same thing. Um, there is a bit of gossip about some of these cases that people aren't really vegetarian, but that if you claim to be the vegetarian, you get a much better diet because they have to go away and think about it. So there was that. Um, I'm not sure. But anyway, they won in the European court. So that was the, the kind of the important thing. Now, this next case um, is kind of important because it had nothing to do with vegetarianism, but... Um, if, if you look there um, on line four, Lord, Wa Lord Walker referred, albeit in an obiter statement. Now, an obiter statement means it's just something that the judge says, and it's not central to the case. So it's just a commentary. So they might be reasoning by analogy. They might be using a comparison from another uh, right, for example, to to you know to 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 give a, a reasoned judgment so this case was about um corporal punishment actually but in the course of the judgment lord walker said that vegetarianism was an example of a belief that fell within the protection of human rights law now that's very important because well the the house of lords now is called the supreme court um, they changed in 2007. So you can see there the UKHL is from the House of Lords. It's 2005. And what the judge said was that, so that's the highest court in the UK. So like this is really important. Pacifism and vegetarianism and total abstinence from alcohol are uncontroversial examples of beliefs which fall within Article 9. Um, then there's, so there's several different bits of legislation, um, both national and then international. And within the EU, you've got employment equality legislation under the framework directive. So that's about employment and also the provision of services. So I'll just explain to you the area that we're talking about. I don't know whether you came across some newspaper reports um, quite recently that within maybe the last year, uh, the Charleville Park Hotel was sued and had to pay off over 20,000, I think, in compensation to um, a number of um, the traveling community who sued them because it, well, according to the court, the hotel didn't want to, um, to have travelers as guests. And so rather than telling them they couldn't come in, they basically said, oh, you can't pay cash. So you have to use a credit card. So they introduced a number of rules that made it impossible for the people who were guests to check in. They took a discrimination case and they won. Now, um, so if you go to a hotel and the hotel tells you, oh, we don't cater for your type here, vegans, they're actually offending the, le the same legislation because you're not allowed to discriminate on nine grounds and ethical beliefs are one of those grounds. And the guardian of the legislation is the Irish Human Rights and Equalities Commission. And they have confirmed to a friend of mine that veganism is a protected belief. Well, that's uncontroversial. We know it is but it's good to have the statement anyway. I've since asked them for an official statement and they haven't answered, but you know, I'm, I'm going to get back to them on that. So um, there's no provision for ethical beliefs under the legislation in Ireland. So, you know, when EU law is introduced, um, each country, when they pass it into their own law, often when you do a comparison across different countries, they've done it slightly differently. And what happened in the UK was that the, the provision on ethical beliefs was extend, like was included into the European legislation, which was domesticated. Um, but the thing is that uh, they didn't have to do that. 
I think that it was a sensible thing to do because you've got a lot of different ethical beliefs. Um, it's a fairly secular society and there's a huge growth in environmentalism and people living in a very um, principled way about different beliefs. So, you know, to name it in the legislation was a good idea. So we haven't done it here, but I think actually what Irish judges um, are likely to do is to look at British cases and take their guidance from that. It's not that they're hostile, it's just that there wasn't a requirement to actually specifically name ethical beliefs um, in this legislation. So remember, if you're at work and you know people start bullying you, you actually have a right to take a case. Now, um, if, if you ever are in that situation, uh, I'm very happy for you to email me. It's a good idea to have a chat and to have a talk through first of all, because if you're very legalistic, people resist. So there's a diplomatic way to handle things, especially if employers are resistant. And, you know, it's like kind of speak softly, but carry a big fist or, you know, um, carry a big stick, sorry. <laughs> um, so, and, you know, um, in, in all the time that I was chair of the Vegetarian Society, we used to help out parents sometimes if, for example, the child was being bullied at school to, um, you know, to, to, to cook meat for exams, exam prep and stuff like that. So um, then Hansard is the record of um, the parliament in Britain. And there is an entry in which Baroness Warsi viewed vegetarianism and veganism as cults whose inclusion in equality legislation was farcical. Um, actually, she's just, I think that when you've got a politician who comes up with that, they just show how completely out of touch they are. And I think that the vast majority of politicians would actually be quite sympathetic. And they might even be vegetarian or vegan themselves anyway. So I'm going to, now I, I have a lot of slides here. So I'm going to kind of um, flick through a few ones. As I said, the Conisby case was the vegetarian case that failed. Um, and the Kazma, Kaza Mithana one, was the vegan case in which veganism has been recognized. Um, yeah, that's just a little bit of... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so then it comes into an interesting domain of food at work for different religious groups. So um, there was one case in which um, a Muslim said that vegetarians had actually been privileged in his workplace because halal food wasn't available vegetarian food and low calorie options were available but then um, in certain breaks there were only bacon rolls so this claim was successful and I mean again it's it's really interesting you see a lot of these cases tribunal cases aren't routinely reported so you might pick up on it on a newspaper but I think that um, the judgments are they're either private or they're not that easily accessible, whereas judgments of the of the superior courts are all published in law journals. Now, I didn't know that when I was a non-lawyer citizen. It was only when I was in my law degree that I realized, OK, you know, if you've got access to a university library, then they're all there. And then um, sometimes Muslims obviously will accept vegetarian options where halal food isn't available. And I went to a very interesting conference a few years ago in Glasgow, in which there was um, a representative from the French Vegetarian Society. And she said that they had started um, teaming up with Muslim groups because the French state was pushing the issue of meat. And obviously it's very targeted against their Muslim minorities that you start sort of pushing pork and stuff like that. So. Um, so these are some of the areas in which actually, you know, you, you can have strange bedfellows sometimes, um, but looking for freedom um, and, you know, um, yeah, freedom of conscience. So then um, sometimes Jews will accept vegetarian food. Um, and yeah, again, some of these cases, there's just a mention of vegetarianism or uh, and the case might not necessarily turn on it. 
Now, Sikhism has produced some very interesting cases. Um, sorry, just a second. How am I doing for time? <laughs> Maybe. I think, okay. I think it's okay. Just continue. Whatever you think is uh, appropriate. Okay, that's fine then. Um, so then there was a, a very, I think this is one of the most fascinating cases because it throws up the difficulties of having, um, I think, a badly managed immigration system in which the state doesn't do anything to welcome people who have come to live in a different country. And I think an awful lot more integration should be done because clearly what happened in this case is that the supervisor doesn't have a clue about practices of people that he's working with. But I mean, there are laws that they mandate equality. And um, so anyway, the, the, the story here was that um, basically Mr. Chatwell was a Sikh and he worked for Wandsworth Council. So there was one day his boss came in and he said, if ye want to use the communal staff kitchen, then you're going to have to engage in a rota for cleaning the fridge. So the manager obviously is dealing with the problem that he's got a filthy kitchen. So he's going to introduce a rota and he says, you have to clean the fridge, you know, in, in turn. So this guy pops up and he says, well, I can't do that because I'm a Sikh and my religion doesn't allow me to touch meat or meat products. Now, the thing was that he was prepared to clean other areas of the kitchen. So at that point, you know, the boss shouldn't have dug his heels in and he should have just said, OK, yeah, well, you know, you can clean the floor, you can clean the countertops or whatever. But no, he dug his heels in and the um, Mr. Chatwell said that he was part of um, a group within Sikhism that they had taken a vow to refrain from eating, touching or preparing meat. Now, I've got Sikh friends and they're not all vegetarian, do you know? And it's one of these things, I think, that um, in Catholic thinking, you're you're a mortal sinner or you're not. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But I think in a lot of Eastern religions, there's a softer approach. So it's kind of something that you maybe aspire to. And then there would be a group within uh, the religion that are a lot more strict. So the EAT, um, the Employment uh, Appeals Tribunal, funny acronym there in the context of vegetarianism, um, he said, they, they said that the tribunal had failed to explain why it denied that Mr. Chatwell um, met the bur burden of proving that there was a significant group of Sikhs who held the same religious belief about uh, touching meat. So basically what the tribunal had done um, was they entered into an inquiry of what percentage of Sikhs followed this in order to give it validity or not. And they shouldn't really do that. They should just accept the belief and providing that it's not injuring anyone, just accept that, okay, that's your religious belief. So you've got to be afforded, you know, the right not to touch meat and just leave it at that. But the tribunal at first instance didn't do that. So it was appealed to the eat. And generally at that level, um, it's a court with more experienced judges, so they kind of know their role better. So anyway, it went in his favor, so the appeal was allowed. But quite traumatic, you know, actually traumatic for all concerned. So it makes me think that, you know, we should have more information about each other. And uh, so I think it's, you know, it's good to talk. Then uh, the NHS uh, advertised a post um, for an occupational therapist in eating disorders um, as recently as uh, 2017 and they said it wasn't open to vegan applicants because they have a restrictive diet so that was actually challenged and the advert was removed and the NHS apologized and actually in the vegetarian society a few years ago we did something similar with Unpost because they had um they had um an ad I think it was something to do with loan sharks 
and they had a picture of a shark out of the water and in agony. And we just felt that, you know, it was very, um, it, it was very damaging because it kind of normalizes violence. So they actually withdrew it. And that's what I'm saying about the softly, softly approach. Sometimes we didn't lambast them or anything, but we wrote to them and we said, look, we're concerned. And you see, you might be speaking to people of a similar persuasion to yourself, because definitely veganism is, um, is, uh, is growing. So then there are a few slides that are just, um, you can read them. I won't go through them because there's some other very interesting ones, but these are all about, you know, the meaning of milk and whether it's allowed. Um, and basically the thing with the EU is it's very bureaucratic. So they'll allow the term coconut milk because it's got a traditional use, but they won't allow the term milk for other products and it's all because of lobbying behind the scenes so um there are just a few slides um on that um just a second now and you remember a few years ago that they were going to rename burgers as discs and tubes but the parliament overturned that and again just to briefly make a comment on some of the eu institutions like the parliament um, is a bit more sensible because they're elected. So they've actually got some contact with the people, but often decisions that the commission make are absolutely bonkers because the commission is kind of the guardian of the, the trade union, as in not trade union, <laughs> as in workers' rights, but the union, like the European Union for trade purposes. So they're always looking at competition from the US, from China, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so, and then they're, they're very, very strongly lobbied both by industry and green groups. So sometimes when they come up with absolutely bonkers stuff like this, there are two things that it tells you. Number one is that they've been lobbied by the industry. And number two, you're not dealing with native English speakers here. An awful lot of the difficulty in reading legislation from the EU is because they use robot translators. And I think this is just a feature of that. So anyway, they've overturned that silly decision. Um, then there are a few um, slides on food classification for the purposes of VAT. So that's interesting. And they're just cases in which if you get classified in a particular category, then you don't pay any VAT. And if you put into another, then you do. And it can be the difference between whether you've got um, an eating chocolate or a cooking chocolate. And it doesn't make any sense. But anyway, the reason that those cases are in there is that they were um, they were mentioned to be, uh, or they, they mentioned that the chocolate was vegan or that the products were vegan. That's why I've included them. So then, um, there was, I think that this is kind of an important case, the Vegetarian Society in the UK a few years ago, they stated in a campaign that meat causes cancer and the, ad, the ads were very graphic. So they were showing post-surgery scars. So there were complaints from the Livestock Commission, the Danish Bacon and Meat Council and the Breast Cancer Campaign. So the Advertising Standards Authority, they ruled that the ads were shocking and unduly distressing. Now the Vegetarian Society didn't agree with that, but um, anyway, you know, it's one of these areas that's kind of, um, it's subject to a lot of, I suppose, disagreement as to how you get your message across. Um, and then this was another interesting case in which um, the Advertising Standards Agency actually banned ads that were persuading consumers to buy so-called welfare-friendly pork. So the ads were claiming that the UK re reared pigs enjoyed better conditions than those in substandard foreign farms. And there was an unusual um, lot of bedfellows here. So the campaign was backed by the Meat and Livestock Commission and they appealed um, to the independent reviewer. 
But um, the complaint was supported by animal welfare campaigners, obviously, because they didn't agree with the fact that, or they didn't agree with the claim that the pork was welfare friendly. And, um, and then obviously there were European competitors complained about it as well. So um, you've got kind of meat proponents and animal welfare or animal rights advocates uh, fighting on the same cause. And then um, I guess I'd nearly better wrap up here, even though I've got about another 40 slides, but Dennis, maybe you'll invite me back to, to finish this up. So Go Vegan World, you might remember that in 2017, it had a campaign and it was displaying posters in public spaces and putting ads in national newspapers, <clears throat> discouraging the use of dairy. We've all seen those, you know, uh, dairy takes babies from its mother, etc. And actually, I met a vegetarian friend of mine, a former vegetarian friend of mine, now vegan, uh, the other day. And she said that um, she said that seeing that ad actually instantly converted her. So it's really interesting, the force of those ads. My conversion to veganism was totally different. It was very long, very slow. Um, my conversion to vegetarianism was like that. Like I gave up overnight, meat eating. Um, but there are a lot of different strategies that work. So anyway, the advertising standard agency, they received complaints, but they actually ruled that Go Vegan World was free to brand milk production in the UK as inhumane. The National Farmers Union stated that it intended to appeal. But I mean, there's no point in appealing that because all they'll get is negative publicity. And then the other thing is that, um, and I think that, you know, when I was preparing these slides, I thought, actually, this information is very valuable because if there are people out there fighting campaigns and I've put this together, um, it's something I, like I definitely want to share because um, it took quite a while to, and, you know, I'm not complaining, it was very, very enjoyable work, but it does actually take quite a while to put all this together. So there's a repository of information on lots of cases. So if anybody's fighting anything, please don't hesitate to get in touch. So anyway, TransLink, the public body that manages the bus service in Northern Ireland, they're afraid as well that they're going to be sued or you know, that they're going to be claims of defamation or whatever. Um, and yeah, they just didn't want to receive loads of complaint, complaints. But I think that Go, Go Vegan World is quite determined and they challenged their reticence successfully and the campaign proceeded. So that's why you can still see all these posters all over the place. Um, I'm just kind of watching my time. Um, it's kind of 10 to 8. And as I said, like, there's no way I've got 93 slides in all and I'm on slide 48. I don't want to be one of these people that rushes on and keeps everybody longer than they want to be. And there might be questions as well. So I think I'm going to stop my presentation there and take any questions um, that you want. And I'm very happy to do another hour for you at any time or just make the slides available and you can read through them yourselves. They're quite detailed. And uh, so, you know, if they raise any questions, you'd be more than welcome. So does that sound okay, Dennis? Yes, yes, Maureen. Okay, 